So last week, we were um, in a sermon um, talking about um, how to handle disputes among believers, if y'all remember that last week, dealing with lawsuits, and it's kind of a weird thing to talk about in church, but evidently the early church in Corinth was uh, suing each other over disputes that they were having, which was very common in that culture because uh, the Greco-Roman Empire um, was very pagan, and so what they would do is if you had problems, you take them to court, let the court settle, the, settle your dispute. Um, the only problem with that is that the judges were pagan. They were very worldly. They were unrighteous. They were ungodly. They didn't have the spirit of God in them. And so you were having a dispute between two b- believers, two brothers, spirit of God. And now you're taking it to an ungodly person to settle your disputes and your, your matters. And Paul says, no, you, know, you need to be able to handle these minor disputes in-house. He said, in fact, a big theological thing he said someday you're going to reign with christ and you're going to judge even the world and angels and so you're going to have so much responsibility in kingdom matters can't you handle minor disputes among yourselves now so it was meant to be convicting to them it was meant to be like okay you guys you know handle your own business within house um but i, I wanted to clarify because i had a conversation with my 15 year old about this afterwards that's dealing with civil disputes. It's not dealing with criminal issues. So when church members have problems, we should try to settle these things amongst ourselves. But if there's a criminal matter, obviously you go to <coughs> the authorities. Some churches have gotten in trouble because they've tried to cover up things and handle things in-house. Um, and these are you need to call the police. Anytime there's something that's going on against a minor, especially in a church, you need to have the police involved. So there's, there's times where you try to handle things in-house, civil, but there's also times when you go to follow the, the court system criminal because these are criminal matters. And so, again, those were, those were that, that, that verse, those, that sermon last week. Um, but the very end of that passage of Scripture, if you remember, there was a long list of sins. And, it, and if you look at that in, in context or out of context, you're like, why in the world would Paul write about civil lawsuits and then all of a sudden list all these different types of sins? I'm going to read these sins to you one more time because it connects what we're going to talk about today. So I don't have a slide up here, but if you have your Bibles or your phones, you can turn to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And then again, this is what we read last week. Paul says in verse 9, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God. Some translations say the unrighteous, the ungodly. Do you not know that the ungodly will not inherit the kingdom of God? Basically what he's saying in context is that people that are not saved, don't you know they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God? They are worldly. They are ungodly. But then he goes on and he tells them, he tells them this. He says, He's talking to the Christian now. Do not be deceived. And here's the list. Neither the sexual immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that's not an exhausted list. That's just some sins, but there's obviously hundreds, if not thousands of more sins that we could have put in this list. But some of these sins are pretty big sins in our culture, right? I mean, they're sexual sins. In fact, the first one he says is sexual immorality. The Greek word is porneia. Uh, we often think of pornographic pornography. Now, it's more than just images on a screen or images in a magazine that is pornography but sexual morality is anything outside of God's design for sex one man one woman in the context of marriage that's the way God has designed it anything outside of that is sexual morality fornication and you can put on any other things in there but he mentions adultery he mentions um, homosexuality these aren't easy topics to talk about, obviously, but I'll tell you, is the culture talking about these topics? Yes. You go to, you watch any commercial, 
And these images are there. Now, I'm not talking like sexually explicit images. I'm talking about innuendos about adultery, how it's acceptable. Um, all the sitcoms that we watch, um, all the movies that you watch, they, they rarely ever show a, a story about a husband and wife in love, you know, and they're enjoying, um, you know, their, their sexual union the way God intended and have kids and, and, and a white picket fence and two dogs and a cat and a two-car garage and they live happily ever after. It's always about, you know, hooking up and meeting people at a bar and, you know, one night stand. And you rarely ever see Hollywood ever portray the, the dark side of the after effects of that. That's the culture. Um, but then he mentions some other things. He, he mentions drunkenness. He mentions swindlers, thieves. Um, greedy people. So there's a lot here on this list. Now, if that ended there, then we would be in trouble. But then he says this in verse 11. And that is what some of you were. Past tense. So some of you were adulterers. Some of you were drunkards. Some of you were uh, sex addicts. Some of you were struggling with your sexual identity. Some of you were having sex outside of marriage. Some of you were thieves and manipulating people. And he said, you're acting like the world. He said, but that's not who you are anymore. And here's why he says you're not like that anymore. He says, you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Three words jump out of there. Wash, sanctified, justified. Washed, some of you who grew up in churches that sang hymns, there's an old hymn that says, What can wash away my... <laughs> so you know the choir people sing, are going to like <laughs> jump into that. But, but think about what can wash away my sin? Not being a good person... Only thing that can wash away your sin is the blood of Christ. Right. And so that's why Jesus it tells us that he who knew no sin actually took on our sin at the cross. That he was righteous. He was perfect. And he went to the cross so that by grace we are saved through faith in him. And when you put your faith in him, you are saved and his spirit enters into you and you are a new creation you now the next word is sanctified that's a big word but that basically means you're set apart you are to be holy you are to be different from the culture you have been bought by the blood of christ and he says now not only that but you are justified you are made right before the father when you stand before the father he's not going to look at all that that junk that you have done in the past or even present or even future now wait a second you're telling me by god's grace i'm saved pastor yes you can't earn it you can't work for it but by grace you're saved through faith so you're telling me pastor that if i'm saved by god's grace that i can go ahead and live like i want to live and i can go ahead and and still practice any type of sexual deviation i want to or still rob people or be a thief and whatever because god's grace will cover my sin. Now, that's a tricky question, and we can go circles and circles around that, but I'll tell you this. A true Christian with the Holy Spirit in you is going to struggle with that and is going to say, I, I don't want that anymore. I've been set free from that type of lifestyle. Now, I can look at, at that list, and I can see myself and some of these things in that list. I came to know Christ in my 20s, and I was uh, a fraternity person so you know what fraternity put fill in the blanks what fraternity guys do and so that's what i was but that's not who i am now i'm a new creation old things have gone new things have come and part of it is not just knowing who i am in christ but it's renewing my mind in fact the, the bible tells us in the book of romans that let me read it to you romans chapter 12 some of you have it memorized but i'm just going to read it to you one and two Paul's writing to the Roman church here. He says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, 
holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Verse 2, do not be conformed any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. See, a lot of times we are set free from our sin, but we haven't changed our mind. We still put our mind in the things of this world. We still watch the movies of this world. We still hang around the people that act like the world, and we still become more like the world. But no, the Bible says you've been set free. The shackles of sin have been taken away. You can now follow a new master. But we choose to still hang out with the world, and the Bible says, no, you're a new creation. So all that being said... It's going to lead us into this topic today, sex, food, and grace. Now, would we all agree that these three things in the way God has designed them are good? God has designed sex to be good between a man and a woman, husband and wife. Would you all agree that's true? Would you all agree that food is designed by God for us to be good? And would you all agree that grace is good? Okay, now with the same three, can we abuse sex? Can we abuse food? And can we abuse grace to give us a license to to sin? So there's the tension. We live in this world. We live in a material world, and I'm a material girl. I'm sorry. (laughs) Sorry, that just came to my mind. I have ADD, some of y'all who are new. That's a song from the 80s, by the way. Um, But we live in a material world world but yet we are spiritual beings and we're not home yet we are passing through we are going home so let's take a look uh, at the next passage of scripture found in 12 if you don't have your bibles look up here this is what paul is saying that the church notice the quotations it, through this set of pass this first couple of verses you're going to see quotations because they have a saying that they keep repeating to paul And this is what they're saying. They they say, I have the right to do anything. Paul says, you say. And then Paul replies, but not everything that you do is beneficial. And then they say, I have the right to do anything. And Paul says, but I'm not going to be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach and stomach for food. And God will destroy them both. And Paul replies, the body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. So they have this debate going on. They're like, you know, Paul, we're under grace. We can do whatever we want to do. Some translations say all things are, are um, permissible, permissible. And Paul says, but not everything is beneficial. Some say all things are lawful. Some of your translations say all things are lawful. It's legal. We can do it. It's legal. Paul says, yeah, it's legal in the culture, but it doesn't mean it's beneficial to you. So there's tension. There's things that Christians face in the culture that's legal. But should we do it? Is it beneficial? So uh, let's try to think through some of these things. Uh, Is it legal for us to go to watch rated R movies? Yeah, I mean, we're under grace. But what if it's sexually explicit? You still have, you're still free to do it, okay? Okay. You, you have the freedom in Christ to do things. You're not, and it's legal. You're not breaking any laws, but is it beneficial to you? You have to answer that question for yourself between you and the Lord. I mean, not all rated R movies. I watch rated R movies. I'm not saying that. You know, The Passion of the Christ, rated R movie, great movie. Um, but nevertheless, some of these movies are not beneficial for us. Some of you might say, okay, well, um, uh, let's see, let me think of some other things that people might say. You want to talk about alcohol? Oh, I knew you were going to say that. Oh, that's a sermon for another topic. No, let's talk about marijuana. Y'all want to talk about marijuana? Okay. So the culture is changing fast. We were in Colorado uh, last summer for our vacation in our hotel room. We got a little note on the door, and the no- note said, um, please do not smoke marijuana in your rooms. This is a non-smoking room they weren't referring to us but there was a general letter to all (laughs) of the people that was staying there and they said we have a place for you to smoke out by the pool so it's legal in in 
in Colorado to smoke marijuana. Okay, and we can debate this, not today, here. We can debate the, the medicinal purposes because there's a huge push about medicinal purpose versus recreational purposes. The point is, probably in our lifetime, in all 50 states, this is going to be legal. And if you are 18 years old and you are a Christian, what do you do about this? Because it's legal. Everything is permissible. I'm under grace. It's legal. Should I do it? Not everything is beneficial because it will get you stoned. Is that the word we still use for marijuana? Wasted, wasted stone. Wasted, wasted, wasted days and wasted nights. See? You're a pagan. I knew it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. That's the culture, though. Alcohol. Can we drink alcohol? Yes. Yes. Okay. But you remember the previous list that we just read? It talked about don't get drunkards. Now, alcohol is a fine line because it's legal. I can do what I want to do. I'm a Christian. I'm saved. I can drink in moderation. Okay. But what if it masters you? Because Paul says, I will not be mastered by anything. Can alcohol become your master? It's permissible, but doesn't mean it's beneficial. You can have a beer. You can have a glass of wine. I'm not saying no, you know. In fact, if y'all know me, I've had a beer with a couple of you guys before. I mean, I don't have a problem with that. Now, my biological brother is a recovering drug addict and a recovering alcoholic. I would never have a beer around my brother because he means too much to me. Because if he starts drinking again, it, he's, um, it's got, he's got control of him. He's, it's mastered him. And it's an addictive thing that he cannot set free. I know Christians that have been set free from alcohol. And I would never encourage them to go back under that, that weight of sin of mastering them. But can you drink it? Yes. But should you be cautious? Yes. I have two friends. I went back to visit some family about a month ago and I had a, a guy that I didn't really know that well but he walked up to me and we're friends on Facebook we were friends kind of in high school he's a year younger than me and he's like hey stranger and I was like how do I know this guy and then I remembered I was like okay I know who this guy but I hadn't seen him in 30 years and we're friends on Facebook but nevertheless we had a conversation and we were like reminiscing hey whatever happened to such and such oh, yeah, remember that? Whatever, whatever. oh yeah whatever and two of the guys that we brought up died younger than us cirrhosis of the liver in their 40s. And I was like, well, what happened to them? How did they get to that point? I said, both of them had marriage problems, and both of them started drinking bottles of vodka, and it just killed their liver. Now, they were adults. I don't know where they're at spiritually, but they had every right to go and drink if they wanted to, but is it beneficial? Not everything is beneficial, and some things, Paul says, can actually master, master become your master. What about food? He says, you say food for the stomach and stomach for food. So can we agree that food is good? We, we said that earlier. All right, it, it's good. Okay. You know how we know it's good? Because in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, God created all things, and he said it is good. The things that he created in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 was fruit-bearing trees, fruit-bearing plants, or seed-bearing plants that we could have vegetables. Did you know that everything that the human body needs can be found uh, in a garden or trees or fruits and vegetables everything <laughs> he said not bacon is what he said <laughs> you're right okay so with exception of bacon so so in genesis 1 2 god creates all these things and then at the very end he creates man and he puts them in there but he'd already created everything that man would need it's like bringing you into a house and the house has got a a, a stack a stocked refrigerator god created everything and then brought man and woman into the garden and he told them to tend it and to work it and to rule and subdue it. But everything they needed for survival was there. They had, had water. God gave them water. He's like, you know, they're going to need water. I'm going to give them clean, fresh. Mm. Man, that's good, right? That's high quality H2O. <laughs> y'all don't want to laugh because y'all know that's a... But what do we do? This is not a beer. Some of you are like, <laughs> some of you are in the back, can't see. You're like, I need to bring my glasses. I know that sound. Mm. Ah, that's a Coke Zero. That's good, right? 
maybe not. I don't even know what I'm drinking. I can't even read that. Did you know that um, the McRib is back for a limited? <laughs> Some of y'all like the McRibs. It's cheap. It's a dollar, you know. <laughs> but they did a study on it. And they said it has over 70 ingredients in this McRib. And half of them, they couldn't pronounce the ingredients. Now, I'm not knocking the McRib. But, but what I'm saying is this. We live in a culture that says, you know, you can eat what you want. But maybe it's not always good for you. Now, am I saying be vegetarian? No. Can you eat a bacon sandwich, a BLT? Yes. Everything is clean. Everything is good. You can enjoy that. But let's be honest. Can too much of it kill us? It can master us. It can high cholesterol us. It can sugar diabetes us. (laughs) It (laughs) It can do all those other things that... The med- when you get your checkup, as you get older, y'all, young, some of you younger, y'all can't relate to this. As you get older, those doctor's visits become more frequent and they become more scary because now they begin to give you like all these prescriptions when you leave. You got to take this, this, and this, and this, and this. And you know what the solution really is? Take care of your body. Walk, drink water, eat healthier, eat more salads. <laughs> But I'd rather have a whatever, whatever, whatever. And this becomes our master. So even, even with food, we can abuse it. And I was preparing this sermon this week, and man, talking about trying to you know, live according to the word. Um, I was working at Bill Miller, and I had a cup of coffee. And I bought a piece of pie. I wasn't even hungry. But they had pecan pie. I was like, oh, pecan pie, you know, it's, it's the time of the year. You're supposed to, like, do this kind of stuff. So I'm sitting there drinking my coffee, reading the scripture. And I'm like, Lord, I don't even, I'm not even hungry. And I push the pie away. And then, you know, I'm reading the scripture, and I'm preparing my sermon, and then I pull the pie closer to me. <laughs> just a little, just eat the top off. You know, just the pecans, those are that's from God. It's in the garden, you know, and they <laughs> grow from trees. And, I eat, and before I knew it, I ate the whole pie. <laughs> Amen? That was good. (laughs) But then I met a guy because we were having a meeting, and he said, hey, he said, hey, uh, I'm going to grab a taco. Do you want a taco? And I'm like, no. Okay, maybe. No, no, no. (laughs) And I drew the line in the sand, and I said, this time I'm not going to do it. And I, by God's grace, I had victory. I did not eat that taco because I was about to have lunch afterwards. This, I struggle with this, and probably some of you do too. You know where it comes from? And I was having a conversation with my sister about this. It comes from when we were kids. In our family, you were showed that you were loved by food. My grandmother, man, she would have all of us 30 cousins over. We're all like 10, 9, 8, 7 years old. And she would just be in the kitchen rolling out homemade tortillas. And she would stack them up this high. And then she'd put that foil over there, and she'd give us plates of beans and rice. And guess what? Grandma didn't have any utensils. You know what we use for utensils? Tortillas. You take that tortilla, mm mm-mm, it's hot and steamy, and you just scoop the beans, mm mm-mm, scoop the rice and beans, mm mm-mm, scoop the beans. And Grandma would come up to you and say, mijo, get us mas tortillas. Oh, yeah, Grandma. (laughs) Because that's her love language. She's like, I love, I want to give him something. And I love you too, Grandma. Give me as many as you, <laughs> as you can. And, and, and for those of y'all who know me, I struggled with my weight my whole life. And when I was in middle school, I was, I, I was the second heaviest kid. I stopped growing this height in middle school. I was the second heaviest kid in our whole school. And I struggled with, with that. I, w- I weighed probably as much, maybe about 20 pounds less in middle school than I do now at a person who's almost 50. This is a real struggle for me and probably for some of you. Is food good in the context of God's design? Is sex good in the context of God's design? So we got to keep on. Let me check the time here. Okay. Um, The body was not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Let's take a look at some, uh, I think we've touched on all these. Um, Real quick, I'll just touch briefly on God's design for sex. We've already talked about it 
Uh, when I do a, a, a wedding, I, I take the couple through Genesis chapter 2 because this is where the first marriage takes place. And so if you look at that in context, you see that um, God said it's not good for a man to be alone. And God said, I'm going to create for you a helper. So he calls man to go into a deep sleep, right? And then as a man was sleeping, God took from him a rib, not a McRib, but a rib. <laughs> and he takes this rib and he creates a woman. And then the Bible says he brings this woman to the man. And the man sees her. And the man says, that for this is my bone and flesh of my flesh. And the Bible says, for this reason, the man will leave his mother and father and the two, male, female, under God's bringing them together, shall become one flesh. They were naked, it said, and they were not ashamed. That was God's initial plan for sex. Be fruitful and multiply. The problem with is the culture promotes all these other types of sexual behavior. Right? I don't mean to point at y'all. <laughs> I'm just like, the culture. <laughs> yeah, sorry. It's just the culture out there promotes this type of behavior. And, and it's very common, unfortunately, for teenagers to explore um, sex. And they're not married. And God has designed it for sex to be good, but in the context of husband and wife it's it's common for for people to well you know um you know i'm having problems in my marriage and so i'm gonna whatever 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 and they fall into the act of adultery and it's not god's plan and and you look at even the homosexual movement now now this i'm this is a tough topic because we probably all know people who struggle with their sexuality or homosexuals or bisexuals or whatever the case might be and I struggle with this as a pastor, but you know what? At the end of the day, I love all sinners, drunkards, wives, thieves, whatever, adulterers, you know, people who are having premarital sex, whatever the case might be, that's still a sin. We got to call it what it is. But I got to stand on God's word. And I got to say it in love. Not to be mean or to hate people, but I got to speak truth. Because if I had to stop speaking truth, who is going to speak truth in this world as a pastor? If, if the pastor stops speaking truth, then where is the word of God going to be proclaimed? It's not. And when, this, when we remove this from the culture, everything is now up for free grabs. And unfortunately, that's where this culture is heading very fast. In 10 years from now, the, the world is going to be a different place than it is today. Marijuana is going to be legal. That's going to be something that Christians are going to have to work through. But you, saint, have the word of God. You need to open it. I can't come into your house and open it for you. Well, I don't have time. Turn off CNN. Turn off Fox News. Turn off Jerry Springer. Is he still even around? Please don't answer that because that means you're all watching. <laughs> but open the word. Stop being conformed to the culture, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Verse 14, our bodies are actually created to be used by God and for his glory because he says that we are parts of his body. He says this, by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us also. There's power in the name of God. Of Jesus, but God, the Holy Spirit, who raised Christ from the dead, is in us. We have power to flee from sin. He goes on 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never, Paul says. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? And then he quotes the Genesis passage, for it is said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever un is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. The, the Corinthian church was doing something that was very legal in their day, and they were, they were going to uh, temples for temple prostitutes. And it was all a, a kind of a disguise for worship. And so people would go to... Uh, the house of worship for Epaphrodites or 
the pagan Diana, and they would go and they would offer up their bodies as sacrifices for sexual pleasure with temple prostitutes. Christians were doing this. And Paul says, no, 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 no. You are the body of Christ. Christ is in you. The Spirit of God is in you. How are you going to take Christ into the temple for the prostitute? He said, may it never be. And, and, and the sobering thing for us is that we should realize that we think to ourselves, well, it's my body. I can do what I want to with it. No, it's not. Because as we're going to see in this next passage, let's read this. Flee from sexuality, sexual immorality, sorry. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Remember, Christ is in us. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God, or who is in you, whom you have received from God, is the question. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, Christian, honor God with your bodies. Our bodies are not our own. When we abuse it, we belong to the Lord. We are actually here on this earth to be his ambassadors, to be his hands and feet, to represent him to a dark world. But when we live like the world and act like the world and think like the world and speak like the world, then we are, we're not doing what God has called us to do. We're actually taking Christ into those situations. We are to be different. The key here, guys, for this is verse 18. What's that word say? Flee. We live in a culture that I think we're so, we, we, we want to see how close we can get to sin without actually sinning. We get tempted, which is normal response. We live in a broken world, but then we, we're like, well, you know, you know, I'm watching a movie, and, you know, there's not uh, something kind of sh- I just want to see a little bit more of this, see where it goes. And before you know it, you're trying to get as close as you can without falling into sin, and before you know it, it's a slow progress before you're actually falling into sin. And the same would be dating in relationships, I don't know how many singles are in this group, but if you put yourself in those situations where, you know, we're just hanging out, we're having coffee, oh, here's a common phrase. We'll see where it leads. It can always lead you down the wrong path. Well, I just want to get, you know, we're not going to do anything. We're just going to cuddle. Next thing you know, you've crossed a line. This is for teenagers, this is for singles, this is for married people who go to work and there's an opposite sex person at the office and they're, you know, we're, we're just friends. We're just hanging out. We're just, you know, and before you know, you're kind of enjoying that time with that person and you kind of like want to see them and you're kind of dressing up to go to work now and you're kind of like working a little bit later afterwards and all of a sudden, hey, let's just grab some coffee. Hey, you know, how's your family home? How's your... Oh, yeah, well, I'm having problems with my husband. Well, I'm having problems with my wife, you know? Well, they don't get me. Well, mine doesn't get me either. Well, maybe we can get each other, you know? Uh, it doesn't happen like that. But typically, the next thing it does is it creates that open door for sexual immorality. And Paul says, flee. Flee from sexual immorality. You remember the guy in the, in the Old Testament named Joseph? Genesis tells us there's a guy in jo- named Joseph who was a fit young man. So imagine a guy who's in great shape, and then there's this older woman. And she says, hey, Joseph, you know, you're under my authority because my husband is your master, and my husband is gone. So, And Joseph says, uh-uh, I'm not playing that. And that's the first time in the Bible the word cougar is mentioned, by the way. <laughs> you got that joke. Older lady was trying to seduce this young man, and, wh- and what did he do? We know the story. He flees. She flips the switch on him, and she says that he actually tried to do something to her, and he gets arrested. So can you get in trouble for doing the right thing? Yeah. Nevertheless, do the right thing. What about David? Y'all remember David in the Bible? Did David flee from temptation? Or did he kind of play with it? 
It was a time when kings went off to war and David was left alone in the palace and David went out and looked upon the kingdom and he saw a woman bathing by the name of Bathsheba. And he says, who's that woman? Go bring her to me. Whoa, 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 David, she's a married man. She's married to Uriah, a married, married woman. She's married to Uriah. And David doesn't let it go. After all, he's a king. And he brings this woman into his house and they have an adulterous relationship. Can, can good men and women stumble and fall? King David did. I can. You can. But what should we do when we're flee? Run like the wind, bullseye. Run. I watch too many movies. Run, Forrest, run. Maybe you also need to flee other temptations too, not just sexual morality. Maybe if you are struggling with alcohol, you don't need to go hang out at the bar with your buddies. Flee. Or maybe if you're <coughs> high school and somebody lights up a, a marijuana joint, you get out of there. You don't need to hang out and see what's going to happen. Or maybe that piece of pie that you've already had a piece of pie and Thanksgiving is a couple of days. You know how, y'all know how it, it goes down, right? Somebody brought a pecan pie. Somebody brought a pumpkin pie. Somebody brought a, you know, your favorite apple pie, and you're trying to be nice. <laughs> and I got to take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and a little bit of that. And then you're depressed because the Cowboys are losing. <laughs> so you go for another pie. Right? Is it just me? And we love it. We, it's socially accepted. To Next week we had a church potluck. Oh, man. <laughs> Food is good. But you don't need to abuse it. We, what we need is the Lord. Sex is good. But you don't need to abuse it. What you need is the Lord. All things are permissible, but not everything is beneficial. I will not be mastered by anything. We have to turn to the Lord. If you're going to flee from that, you've got to run to Jesus. If you're going to run somewhere, you've got to run to Jesus. I promise you, you run to him. He will meet the needs that you're longing for. Let me pray for you.